Tonight, Australia vows to continue its alliance with the US, India and Japan as Joe Biden puts China in focus. Good evening, I'm Isabella Tolhurst. This is ABC News Northern Territory. Also tonight, voters in Sri Lanka decide on a president in the first poll since the country's economic collapse. Israel braces for further Hezbollah retaliation after killing 16 of its most senior leaders. And looking up, Darwin skies fill with colour for a festival of kinds. U.S. President Joe Biden has accused China of acting aggressively in the Pacific, arguing Beijing is testing Australia and other countries in the region. The outgoing leader's comments were captured in a hot mic moment during a summit of Quad leaders, including Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. North America correspondent Jade McMillan is in Claymont, Delaware. Fresh from his visit to Joe Biden's home, Anthony Albanese was welcomed to his old high school. It is absolutely delightful uh, to be here amongst friends. Joining the leaders of India and Japan for the president's final quad meeting. We're democracies. We're democracies who know how to get things done. The quad is not, it doesn't have a long history. That means it's not defined by tradition, but it also means it's not confined by it. It means that as it develops, uh, it can evolve. Joe Biden elevated the grouping to the leadership level in the early days of his presidency, in what's seen as an effort to counter China's expanding influence in the Indo-Pacific region. And in an audio feed still running after the cameras left, the president's message to the Quad behind closed doors was clear. China continues to behave aggressively, testing us all across the region. And it's true in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, South, China, South Asia and the Taiwan Straits. The leaders agreed to closer maritime ties, including joint Coast Guard operations, that the US says will take place in the South China Sea. The four countries will have personnel on perhaps a single vessel uh, improving the interoperability and the cooperation that occurs. Joe Biden is trying to use his remaining time in office to solidify his foreign policy legacy. The president using this meeting to send a signal that he wants America's increased focus on the Indo-Pacific to outlast his administration. Mr President, will the Quad survive beyond the election in November? <laughs> With Japan's Prime Minister also stepping down, and an Australian election approaching, there'll be at least a couple of new faces at the next Quad meeting. Never goodbye. He's at the end of the telephone. I get these. Another farewell in Joe Biden's long goodbye. Jade McMillan, ABC News, Claymont, Delaware. Sri Lanka is witnessing a major political upset tonight with a leftist candidate surpassing heavyweights to become the front runner for the top job. The National People's Power leader is on track to become the country's next president in the first poll since Sri Lanka's worst economic collapse in history. South Asia correspondent Ellie Grounds reports from Colombo. Armed police on the streets of Colombo. The post-poll curfew was extended as the vote count went on. Sri Lankans turned out for the poll in close to record numbers, ready to have their say. Once the curfew was lifted, people were back out on the streets with a sense of change in the air. He a uh, good politician for us. He is a good leader. This is the first time Sri Lankan people change this elite establishment which destroyed the pride and the sovereignty and the economy and the future of this country. Left-wing leader Anuru Kumara Disanayaka will have a huge job ahead of him. Though the queues for fuel and medicine may be gone, essentials are still unaffordable for many Sri Lankans. The price of milk powder, a staple, has nearly tripled since before the crisis. And the country is in more than $4.4 billion debt to the International Monetary Fund for a bailout, which Disanayaka has vowed to renegotiate. 
Critics say he's not ready for the challenge, but his camp isn't worried. They have voted us, so I think that uh, people have completely uh, disregarded that criticism. The next likely president fought off two high-profile challenges. The incumbent, Ranil Vikramasinghe, who steered Sri Lanka away from bankruptcy with the IMF deal, and opposition leader, Sajit Premadasa. Another upset, the complete wipeout of the Rajapaksha family, who have dominated Sri Lankan politics for decades. They were like uh, kings, they were like emperors here, uh, but people have completely deleted them. One of the most repeated words throughout this election campaign was change. With these results, Sri Lankans have clearly shown they're fed up with the politics of the past and want to take the country in a different direction. Ellie Grounds, ABC News, Colombo. Israel is bracing for further retaliation from Hezbollah after killing a senior militant commander in a strike in Lebanon's capital. Authorities in Beirut say the strike killed 45 people, including women and children. Tonight, Israeli forces and Hezbollah militants are exchanging intense fire along the border, with the militant group also launching a barrage of rockets deep into Israeli territory. An eight-storey apartment block in Lebanon's capital reduced to rubble. Emergency crews and civilians sift through the remains of Israel's latest strike that left behind a scene of devastation. People were coming home from work and some were coming to pick up their children from the nursery. It's unbelievable. This blast killed at least 45 people, including women and children. Among those killed was senior Hezbollah commander Ibrahim Ail, who led the group's elite unit, the Radwan Force. No matter how much they strike us, we will not waver. The strike sparked a significant Hezbollah response deep into Israeli territory, this footage showing Israel's Iron Dome missile defence system in action. With fears further retaliation could follow, the Israeli army ordered restrictions on large public gatherings across the country's north and cancelled all education activities. Dozens of Israeli Air Force aircraft are currently striking terrorist targets and rocket launchers to remove the threat to Israeli civilians. The conflict is not just a war of weapons, but a war of words and ideas. Well, we're just going to break into some news that's coming uh, in our Al Jazeera office. Israeli soldiers raiding Qatari broadcaster Al Jazeera's office in the West Bank with a military order to shut down the bureau for 45 days. But as Israel flexes its military might on a growing number of fronts, anger and opposition to the war back home is growing. With calls for peace and a return of hostages growing ever stronger. As the conflict continues, a grim toll on the people of Gaza. More than 41,000 dead in the Gaza Strip since October 7. Alison Horn, ABC News, Jerusalem. Russia's military says it's shot down more than 100 Ukrainian drones fired into its airspace overnight as the conflict between the two countries rages on. One Ukrainian attack on a munitions depot caused an uncontrollable fire, sparking a massive explosion near the Russian city of Krasnodar. An apartment block in Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, was damaged in an explosion overnight, injuring 12 civilians. Ukrainian authorities blamed a Russian bomb. The family of a New Zealand pilot held hostage in Indonesia for over one and a half years says they're feeling relieved and extremely grateful that he's been freed. Philip Mertens was kidnapped last year from an airport in the province of Papua. He was taken by an armed rebel group looking to use him as a bargaining chip to seek independence from Indonesia. In a statement, the 38-year-old's family thanked Indonesian and New Zealand authorities for their work in getting him released. They also expressed gratitude to the rebel army for keeping Mertens safe and healthy. 
Health Minister Mark Butler says Australia will have millions more IV fluid bags than it needs, despite doctors still being told they need to conserve them. The Australian College of Anaesthetists says many doctors are still giving patients less IV fluid than they'd like to, following recent shortages. However, the government says it's secured 22 million bags for a six-month period, which is about three million more than it would typically secure over that time. Mr Butler says he's confident in Australia's supply. We're looking at longer term security of supply as well. For example, our major manufacturer here in Australia will be opening an additional production line in coming weeks. Victorian police are preparing a brief of evidence for an Italian court after an arrest was made over the notorious Easy Street murders almost half a century ago. The breakthrough has been decades in the making, but his extradition could still be a lengthy process. After almost 50 years of carefully collecting evidence, another crucial piece of the puzzle was just found in Italy. 65-year-old Perry Carumbulus arrested over one of Melbourne's most notorious murders. It's quite a spectacular breakthrough and uh, full marks of Victorian police for getting to it. That breakthrough came after a request from Victoria Police to Interpol, which issued an international red notice. The notice includes identifying information about the fugitive and details of the crime they are wanted for. Perry Karumbalos is understood to be a former student at the Collingwood School where Susan Bartlett was a teacher. She and her housemate, Suzanne Armstrong, were brutally killed in their Easy Street home in Collingwood in January 1977. Suzanne Armstrong's 16-month-old son was left stranded in his cot for days. He grew up without his mum, but police never gave up. Are there any scientific investigations taking place? Oh, yes. Uh, they certainly are. In 1977, when this double murder took place, we didn't understand how impactful and useful DNA was going to be in terms of solving crime. So it's really quite remarkable that this evidence was maintained. The 65-year-old has been on Victoria Police's radar for years, wanted but out of reach, when he moved from Melbourne to Greece, where the local statute of limitations prevented his arrest. But on Thursday, his arrival at a Rome airport flagged the Interpol red notice. To get him back, Victoria Police has 45 days to formally request extradition through the Attorney-General. They'll then need to formally seek from the Commonwealth Government uh, an international arrest warrant by way of an extradition request uh, directly to Italy. But from there, the process could take months or even years. If the extradition is approved and Corumbulus is sent back, then charged with murder, he would be tried here in Melbourne. Loved ones of Suzanne Armstrong and Susan Bartlett hope the truth will finally be revealed. Cyan Valance, ABC News, Melbourne. Regional Australia is on the front line of the country's shift to renewable energy, but wind and solar farms aren't always welcomed. However, locals are on board with a proposed project in the South Australian town of Hay, deliver, brokering a deal they believe can deliver long-term benefits. Emily Doak has this Stateline report. On the vast Hay Plain, renewable energy is just over the horizon. This will be the largest economic and physical change that this community has experienced since settlement. Construction of high voltage transmission lines will make large scale wind and solar possible with community support and conditions. We are going to welcome this transition, but you are going to consider us at every point. While projects still need final approval, Hayshire Council's negotiated agreements with developers that include long-term housing projects, subsidies for rooftop solar and cheaper electricity for the whole town. Residents could receive a $1,000 rebate on their energy bill every year for the next 30 years. It will actually embed wealth into the whole community. South of the Murray, independent MP Helen Haynes is calling on the federal government to help other regions do the same. We've got to move our mindset away from purchasing social licence from communities into uh, long-term regional development. No consultation! No consent! In many parts of the country, there's been fierce opposition to renewables. 
but French multinational NG says that's not the case at Hay. And we received zero local objections, which is extremely rare for an energy project in the country. The company wants to build almost 200 wind turbines and 900,000 solar panels plus battery storage. Some of the turbines would be on Richard Cannon's land, providing drought-proof farm income, but he wants the benefits to stretch further. Landholders can see it to their business. Um, the community can see it to um, you know, support for projects in Hay. And it's an industry not relying on agriculture. On the floodplains at Gaini, west of Hay, pelicans are feasting. These environmentally significant wetlands are being restored by the Nari Nari Tribal Council. It's looking to renewable energy to help fund conservation and social programs for Indigenous youth. Turn country back to its near natural state and having the financial base to do that, to have that impact on people and country, that's the biggest outcome you can give. The wind farm footprint for us is just in here on our boundary. Partnering with Kalara Energy and Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners, they plan to build more than 70 turbines, 30 kilometres away from the wetlands on grazing land. Less than 1% of renewable energy developments in Australia have Indigenous ownership, compared with 20% in Canada. This project is showing that traditional owners can not only claim income from hosting turbines, but share in the equity and the decision-making. It makes us independent. and. That's what we've thrived to do for many moons and we're not far off doing it. Putting the power in the hands of the people. Emily Doak, ABC News, Hay. Hundreds of Australian Defence Force soldiers landed in Darwin this afternoon after a month-long deployment in Indonesia. Exercise Super Garuda Shield involved Australian, Indonesian, US and Japanese Defence Forces. The soldiers rehearsed warfighting scenarios in the Javanese jungle. This year's exercise follows the recent si signing of a defence pact between Australia and Indonesia. We achieved a lot in terms of establishing relationships and friendships and showing that we can work together. So into the future with our new defence agreement, I think we can look to go bigger and better and work even uh, on larger sort of scale operations into the future. Brisbane had been written off but never lost belief, producing a lion-hearted comeback to defeat Geelong in a prelim at the MCG. It sets up a decider against Sydney. It'll be the first time the Swans and the Lions have met in a grand final in 125 years. No longer just Lion Kings, but comeback kings. So, Brisbane just had unfinished business to attend to. Fans watched on in Brisbane's pubs. <laughs> From lounge rooms around the country. Oh my God! And in the packed MCG stands, the siren triggered scenes of ecstasy. From two and five to start the season to still standing on the last Saturday in September. If you had have said to me at the halfway mark of the season we're going to be playing in the grand final at the end of the year, I probably would have said you're, you're crazy. 44 points down last week, it was 25 points the Lions had to claw back against the Cats. To Logan Morris, out by two goals, the Brisbane Lions. As Brisbane ensured a non-Victorian decider for the first time since 2006. That's great for footy in those states, it's sort of old Fitzroy versus South Melbourne. The Swans held an open fan session today at the SCG. Definitely spurs us on that little bit more at the end of quarters and uh, we're very grateful to have such great supporter base. Parochial supporter Kenny Williams died just after the club's last grand final in 2022, but his daughter says his spirit will be with the players on Saturday. I have been to all of them except for the 96. Um, it's amazing being in the dressing room with my dad. He's so tiny and like people like Adam Goods picking him up and kissing him. Go Jessica Stewart, ABC News. As we just heard, Brisbane's into its second consecutive AFL Grand Final after another stirring comeback win in the preliminary final. 93,000 fans packed out the MCG last night as Brisbane found another gear to overcome Geelong by 10 points. 
Another unbelievable comeback. Those that were here will never forget what they saw. The Lions roaring late for the second week running to book their place in the grand final. Feeling uh, very proud of our group. Fantastic win against a tremendous footy club in Geelong. Geelong took control in a seven-goal second quarter with Brian Myers and Ollie Henry dominating. No way! How's about that for a finish? The Cats were up by 25 points early in the third term and with the Lions' ruckman hurt, Brisbane was depleted but not discouraged. They are back within a point. And their best was yet to come. Kyle the Cats were unrelenting in their forward pressure as the game came down to the wire. Henry Giles! What seeds at the MCG! And with no time to spare, fast footwork was needed. RT has gone for Brisbane! And the sealer soon followed. And a shot for goal to the left! Cam Reid has got it! Brisbane now face a selection dilemma in the ruck with Oscar McInerney already ruled out after twice dislocating his shoulder. It'll be a downer for us that he can't play in the grand final, but I know the boys will probably um, find a way to use that as a dedication for the game as well. The Cats will be forced to lick their wounds. You know, this is me at my worst. Real disappointed, and we've got to acknowledge that. And wonder what could have been. The careers of Tom Hawkins and Zach Tui now over after missing out on selection. But pulls at the heartstrings. You know, just when you don't think you could feel any worse, you start thinking about that stuff. The Lions' slow and steady climb into contention this season is complete and a return trip to Melbourne and a date with Sydney at the MCG now awaits. Erin Marcicovetere, ABC News. The Adelaide Crows remain the AFLW's benchmark team as they maintained their perfect start to the season with a win over Essendon. The Western Bulldogs had a big win over Collingwood, while Sydney held off a fast-finishing GWS and Brisbane thrashed West Coast. The undefeated Adelaide hosted the struggling Bombers, looking to return to the top of the AFLW ladder. She has popped it through from the angle. Essendon dominated territory in the opening term and managed to convert to stay with the Crows. But a late Neve Kelly goal gave the Crows the advantage at the first break. And Kelly goes right on the quarter time siren. A four goal to two second term from Adelaide gave them a healthy buffer, which they didn't give up as they recorded a fourth win of the season. At Victoria Park, Collingwood and the Western Bulldogs battled to record their first wins of the season and it was the Pies who led at the first break. But the Dogs took control in the second, kicking three unanswered goals to open a nine-point lead. From there, the Western Bulldogs were in complete control as they cruised home and off the bottom of the ladder. Both Sydney and GWS were looking to get back on the winner's list, a three-goal opening term from Sydney giving them a 12-point lead. It's soccer through! It's soccer through from Ham! Michaela Poga could be in strife for a dangerous tackle which left Montana Ham needing a head injury assessment. The Swans looked on track for a comfortable win before the Giants made a late run, but it was too little, too late, as Sydney held on for victory to keep in touch with the top eight. West Coast has been a revelation under Daisy Pearce, but Brisbane is a premiership contender. And the Lions quickly showed why as they kicked three goals before the Eagles even went inside 50. Brisbane are going to kick their third. West Coast had no answers as Brisbane ran rampant on the way to a big win. Tom Wildey, ABC News. The Sydney Roosters have crushed the NRL finals hopes of the Manly Sea Eagles. It was a runaway win for the Tricolours after a furious start in last night's semi-final. A sudden death battle of the beaches at the Sydney football stadium. And in the NRLW, the Broncos have claimed the competition's minor premiership over the Titans earlier today. Raiders co-captain Zahara Tamara became the first NRLW player to reach 200 points. And rugby league pioneer Karina Brown played her final match of her 14-year career. With colour this weekend for a yearly kite festival. After last year's unexpected success, the event has taken off once again along the city's coastline. The young and the young at heart unfurled their kites to the wind. I think it's for everybody, really, at any age, I guess. It's, um, yeah, it brings out the child in everybody. We love kites! A community event on Darwin's coastline, families delighted at the scale of this weekend's kite display.
I love the the uh, the big whale. I think he looks fantastic. There's a shark. There's um, there's some that we haven't seen yet that I'm told are, are going to look amazing as well. So it is hard to choose a favourite. They're just all so big and spectacular. After thousands attended the one-day event last year, organisers decided to add a second day this time. It was fantastic. We were really surprised at how much people embraced it. We had over 12,000 people come down last year, so um, we've expanded over two days this year. On a windy day like today, the waste that some of these kites can generate can get up to a tonne, and it takes a whole crew of dedicated volunteers to be able to keep them from flying away entirely. And strong winds almost had this sea creature stranded in the trees. But with the aid of onlookers, the giant beast was tethered. This weekend's display, a labour of love from a group of passionate interstate kite enthusiasts. Basically, we're a non-for-profit organisation, so we rely heavily on um, support. Further up the beach, flyers of a smaller variety also had their hands full. Don't let go. Don't let go. Hold it. The beginning of a permanent calendar fixture taking flight. Oliver Chasling, ABC News. Time for a check of the weather, starting with this photo of Daly River that Brian Dallow sent in. Some showers and storms in the Daly and Gregory districts today and some rain around Alice Springs. Cloudy through the centre. It was 35 in Darwin today, 36 in Batchelor and it got up to 40 in Jabiru. Zooming out, 38 degrees was the high in Catherine and 33 in Nullumboy. Tennant Creek reached 34 and Alice Springs saw a top of 31. On the satellite, extensive cloud covers much of the NT and WA, while a string of cloud bands are crossing Tasmania. The clouds in the south are associated with a series of cold fronts, while a trough over WA is the cause of widespread showers and storms in the north. Around the country tomorrow, Brisbane and Sydney both sunny and 27 degrees, Canberra 22 mostly sunny, partly cloudy in Melbourne a top of 19, Hobart 17, Adelaide 19 and Perth with sunshine a top of 23 there. Around the Territory tomorrow, showers in the centre, Alice Springs 24, Tennant Creek a top of 31. Further north, 38 in Catherine, 31 in Nullumboy, heading for 37 in Daly Waters and Borroloola. And in the west, Darwin a top of 33, Jabiru 37 degrees and some showers a top of 31 in what air. The afternoon low tide will be at 3.38 tomorrow and winds will reach up to 15 knots off Darwin. The sun will rise tomorrow at 6.34 and you can watch it set at 6.43. And taking a look at the rest of the week, a mostly sunny week in Darwin until Thursday when the chance of showers increases again. And in Alice Springs, there's a high chance of showers and storms for the next few days, clearing briefly on Thursday before another cloud band moves in next weekend. And that's ABC News for this Sunday night. Thank you for your company. Good night.